Good afternoon. Welcome to today's webinar on the Hayden housing story, how a small town is addressing a big issue. My name is Melissa Mata. I am the Municipal Research Analyst with the Colorado Municipal League. And with me today are Matthew Mendisco and Tegan Everett from the town of Hayden. I will kick it over to them in just a moment. But first, I want to cover a few housekeeping issues. The first is that all participants are muted for today's webinar. We do encourage you to ask questions, however. You will see a control panel to the right of your screen, and in that control panel, there is a question box. We encourage you to type in your questions throughout the webinar, and we'll have a Q&A period at the end of the presentation. I do want to remind all elected officials today that attendance of today's webinars will give you one university credit. No action is needed to get that credit. We'll just mark it on your account following the webinar. So Matthew Mendisco. Matthew is the town manager for the town of Hayden. He has served in that capacity for the last six plus years. And prior to Hayden, Matthew was a management consultant for Clifton Larson Allen Public Sector Group for 10 years. And he was a best and brightest intern for the city of Fruta from 2006 to 2007. Matthew serves on various boards, including CCCMA's DEI committee, where he is the vice chair. Tegan Ebert is the community development director for the town of Hayden. Her educational background is in public administration and public policy. She has been working for the town of Hayden for almost a year, and previously she worked for Route County as a land use planner. She has called the Hayden area home for the past six years. So with that, I'll go ahead and kick it over to you too. Thank you, Melissa. This webinar is focused around a story, specifically a housing story. Housing stories are unique because they're all different. Just like stories we tell to each other when we're talking about our own homes and how we decorate them and everything else. But we're talking about it as a community this time. And what we're going to get into, we're going to get into a lot of 30,000 foot level stuff. I'm going to start with that and then we're going to move on with Tegan, who's going to move through a lot of our data and process that we went through our housing needs assessment. And then we'll wrap that up and uh, we'll welcome questions. So next slide. Melissa, can you change the slide? Yes, I did Thank change you. the slide. Not showing. Oh, I think there was just a slight, slight lag there. Okay. Yeah, that's okay. Um, so we're starting off with this specifically. This is the Hayden purpose statement, our vision statement our mission statement and our values. I want everybody to look through this because these are what have driven our housing model, our housing story. Um, and when you're having questions, how many people have a purpose statement? Everybody has vision statements typically and mission statements and values, but do you has, have you sat back as, a community and said, or as a local government and said, what is our purpose? And Hayden, we went through a pretty extensive process and we decided that it was, we existed to be a place to thrive. And then as you can see, we went through our missions, our vision and our mission, and then our values. These are at the core of everything we do. I would encourage you no matter what policy it is, Housing, however you look at housing, do not lose sight of these because they are what are driving your community. I think sometimes we tend to get caught up and lose sight of these things, but um, they should be at the forefront of everything you're doing. And I think it's just a good reminder to look at them. Next slide. So. Just to spend a little bit of time, I'm gonna look at some data. Hayden, our housing story is really at the end of the day driven by a lot of data. And, but a, a quote, we found an article from the Colorado Business Journal in 1978. I wonder if this rings true for everybody today. The worst thing that coal has done is that it's increased housing and land prices drastically. 
you can't buy a new two-bedroom house for less than 45000 if you can find one. Key things in there. Industry has increased prices, and you couldn't find one. So you had a supply and demand problem. Uh, next, we had we looked at our population growth over time, available housing units, and then our household average size. So these are all from the Department of Local Affairs State Demographer Office. They have wonderful data, more data than you can, can figure out, and that's what drove our housing model was basically looking at the, and we had the fortunate, uh, we did right after the census data came out, so we had really great data to work with. But if you look at our population growth, Hayden is a small community. We're at this point in 2021, we were about 1,937 people. 2010, we were 1,805. So a little bit of population growth, 7% over 11 years. But then if you look at our available housing units, starting in 2010, 807, 2021, 847. An increase, but smaller than the population increase. So you start to see those supply and demand lines crossing already, even in 2010. And then if you look at average household size, you would think, oh, well, our average household size is getting smaller. That means less people or smaller family sizes. However, when you are, say, a double income, no kid, individuals who are remote workers, which our remote working industry is increasing dramatically, um, you prioritize that third bedroom as a workspace. So our housing is still in high demand, even though families are not consuming as much room in those homes. Next slide. It looks like the lag today must be a little longer than usual. So hopefully the next <laughs> slide's coming. There it is. This is just a quick map of Hayden um, to give you perspective of what it looks like. We're a full service municipality and we also have a regional airport within our boundary. So next slide. And something to note, because that regional airport is in our boundary and we have a state highway coming through the middle of Hayden, um, our population increase day to day goes from our normal population and then all those people who are sitting at the airport, it's like increases anywhere from three to 5,000 a day. And then with Highway 40, which has 8,000 trips a day through Hayden, um, our population swings highly during certain times of the day. Let me go ahead and unsh- oh, there it goes. Next time I might try to unshare my screen and reshare it because I have never seen a lag that lasts a full minute between slides. Okay, quickly, this is our regional map just to give you perspective, but the important part here, which is really hard to see because there's a lot of other Google stuff on here, is this has all the municipalities within Northwest Colorado, excluding Dinosaur on the very west side of Moffat County. But the important thing to note is that Hayden and Steamboat Springs have population increases from 2010 to 2021. But Craig, Yampa, and Oak Creek, according to the State Demographer's Office, actually had slight population decreases depending on where you look. Um, However, Oak Creek and Yampa are now experiencing the same housing prices issues that we are. So the question is why? You know, it's easy to see supply and demand if you have more population than housing units, but they have a decrease in population, yet their housing is still in just as high demand. Next slide. It's I stopped sharing my screen so that I can try to start over and see if it'll work this time. So 
Yep, you can see the visible lag. We do record these to put online, Matthew and Tegan. I may end up asking you to record it without an audience um, after this so that it can go online without all of these breaks. Um, unfortunately, for our attendees who are here today, I'm not sure if we can correct this lag issue that's happening online. But with that, well, hopefully you we'll can We'll do our that. best. Yes. We'll do our best. So this, how do you determine housing needs? Tegan's going to get into our housing needs assessment specifically, but you know, while Hayden knew it had a housing crisis, I mean, our market values in 2020 to 2022 literally increased over a two-year period by 65%. We didn't know how many units we needed. We didn't know we didn't know a lot of things. We just knew that we saw prices increasing and we saw less and less inventory every day. You know, we're a community and coal transition. Um, but the funny part about that is, is, you know, housing is the most expensive it's ever been. Resources, we have one FTE dedicated to community development uh, to work on housing, um, which is Tegan. She's also our community development director for planning. So um, it, we'll get into that in a second. You know, and then the, the big question for our council was whose role was it to work on housing? Traditionally, private sector had built homes or people or whatever, and that, you know, Hayden as a as a municipality had never entered into working on that as part of our economic development plan. But I would ask you a question. If you have a lack of inventory, but you need to grow your jobs because you're going to be in transition, whatever transition, we're in coal transition, but communities are dealing with all sorts of transitions. How many good jobs and people can you attract and or how many good jobs for just returning people can you have if they can't find housing? So we made that decision and we went down the housing path. Next slide. Quickly, we defined housing into a project. So we have these like in your master plan, we have them as projects uh, because it helps us narrow down on things. We wanted to complete our housing needs assessment within eight months, complete our housing policy, which we'll get into at the end, and address housing needs within five years because we know we have this unique five-year window in terms of coal transition and also a lot of the activity that's happening to the east of us in terms of Steamboat Springs. So we have a five, we've targeted a five-year window to address our needs. Next slide. Um, and the, the final question of housing needs assessment, do you really need one? You know, we're not huge advocates of another study because I tend to, I tend to believe that things get studied just beyond the, you know, just beyond what they probably need to be. However, um, you're not going to get access to funding if you don't have a housing needs assessment because you have to be able to justify the amount of money to build the amount of units that you want to build. So it's imperative to have one. But the policy impacts, what type of housing policy should the town have? Which is what we'll get into at the very end. But this was a big question within the assessment. Next slide. Finally, quickly, project funding breakdown. We had an RFP, we only got one result, but it, they were a quality company. We went with them, it was $60,000. DOLA provided a planning grant for $45,000, and then Chaffa supplied a $15,000 grant. So we were able to cover the entire expense of the housing needs assessment. Next slide. And this is where Tegan will take over, and then I'll come back at the end. So when we embarked on our housing needs assessment process, um, how that initially started in 2020, the town of Hayden decided to redo their master plan. And through that process, there was a lot of um, indication that we were starting to have a housing problem here. And one of those action items within that um, Hayden Forward master plan was to explore what's going on with housing more. So that really started the need to desire to want to move forward with the housing needs assessment. 
the very first step in that process was identifying who we are and what we want um, as a community. So like Matthew said, we're a Northwest Colorado rural small community. We're in coal transition. We're situated between these two larger communities. Um, and we're also a community that really identifies as being rural, being involved in agriculture. Um, people really embrace that rural identity here. So what type of housing makes sense for our community? Um, when we started the process, a housing needs assessment steering committee was formed. So we asked some of those questions. What do you want to see changed over the next five years? Um, and we got answers like more housing, more diversity of housing type, um, rentals, which we lack immensely in this community, um, and the opportunity to move up into different housing varieties. So that was the very first step. Next slide, please. And then kind of the second step is, what does affordability actually mean for our specific community? So this is the story of Hayden, which is, affordability means different things, different places. Um, I mean, the general standard you're gonna look at is 30% of your net income, um, you know, it's kind of the maximum that you want to go towards your housing. If you're paying more than that, it's considered debt burdened. So that's no longer affordable. Um, so if in Hayden, the average family is bringing in $80,000. That's a $2,000 maximum towards housing. So we needed to figure out what does affordability actually mean here? And that's based on what people are getting paid and what reasonably somebody could expect here to get paid from an employer as that average median income. Um, in order to move forward, we had to establish that. Next slide. So very quickly, um, why housing, Hayden's housing market is not meeting demand. I, I just want to put it forward that, you know, most of this is not rocket science. If you just dig into your data, it's pretty easy to figure out. Our housing needs assessment quickly came to the conclusion that, you know, a combination of inflation, supply chain, general rising costs have driven up the cost to build a home. And when the cost of building you know, the same home in Steamboat as in Hayden, but your margin is 50% more, you're gonna gravitate as a developer over towards Hayden. So our, our challenge here, uh, excuse me, in Steamboat Springs. So our challenge is if a two by four costs the same amount of money, how do we convince, how do, how do we work with the development community to, to bring them here, which Tegan will address later. And then second, you know, we have a housing and a jobs mismatch because we're a bedroom community, as Tegan's gonna point out. We have a lot of people traveling from Hayden to Steamboat Springs where the majority of the jobs are sitting. Um, so we have this, it's created this ultra competitive market for existing homes, especially from remote work. And then finally, limited housing supply. We just talked about it in our housing needs assessment. You're gonna see our rental, our rental vacancy rate is effectively zero. There was only one unit that came on during the entire housing needs assessment that was actually advertised. And then our for sale rate, which was a two week supply is very, very short um, based on the demand. So, you know, when you're thinking about these things, if you're just digging into your data, you're gonna quickly find what's driving these housing demand issues. Next slide. I'll just start talking before it's left, before it moves. Um, so through our housing needs assessment process, we really had to narrow down the scope of exactly what we were looking for. Um, so our housing needs assessment was a little unique in the fact that our um, consultant team looked at a narrow scope of what our existing Hayden area employers needed for housing for them to be able to operate and do any sort of um, anticipated expansion of operations within the next five years. So we weren't looking at down valley pressure 
Um, we were analyzing potential future industry growth. This was really like, what do we need to survive with what we have here now? Um, the little caveat to that as, is that as a coal transition community, we spend a lot of time prioritizing and thinking about growing and diversifying our economy, making it healthier and better balanced. Um, and as a result, the town is putting a lot of effort into um, you know, growing the ability for folks to work here um, and bringing businesses in and helping our existing businesses expand. So these numbers are quite conservative because they're really based on our employers here now and how to keep those businesses here operating. Because when you're looking at keeping your economy healthy, one of the lowest, lowest hanging fruit is retaining your existing businesses. We don't wanna lose anybody. Um, it's really hard to retain your existing businesses if they cannot find any housing for the workforce. So it was identified in our housing needs assessment, we need, you know, over the next five years just to kind of retain our existing workforce housing, 125 to 150 units. Um, so when we consider also expanding and bringing in new businesses, that effectively is a much larger number. Next slide, please. And I'll like just keep your going. Chicken. Keep going. Yeah. I'll, um, so additionally, when we have folks leave the workforce because they're retiring, we've got you know some people aging out of the workforce. Anecdotally, if they choose to stay in this community, we don't really have any transitional housing. We don't have this continuum of housing types that somebody might be able to access through their entire lifespan of needing housing. So we don't have, you know, the realistic housing options for maybe young adults who are leaving their parents' house who want to stay in this community um, because we have such a small rental market. Um, and when people retire and maybe they want to downsize, we don't have downsize housing availability. So people stay in those homes. So when you're looking at a workforce where you've got folks maybe retiring out and needing additional workforce to come in, we don't really have new units opening up because nobody has any mobility throughout our um, housing market here. Next slide, please. And again, these numbers are not taking into account that down value pressure or expansion of um, you know, bringing new businesses into our economy. So what was well established um, in our housing needs assessment is that we really have an inventory issue. Um, and particularly, we have an inventory issue at the AMI levels, area median income levels, that people here in Hayden have. So the salaries that are available to folks that actually work in the Yampa Valley do not match that very minuscule amount of availability that we do in fact have. So all this data was collected prior to interest rate increases. So it's not also reflecting that additional barrier to difficulty getting into a housing unit here. Um, and in order to have a chance at purchasing a house in Eden, at this moment in time, you have to make well above the average median income. Um, you know, 200% plus to be able to cap, you know, get any of those units off the market. And you can wait an entire year and never see anything come on the market that's within your price point. So these are really great data points to be able to use in conversations with developers. We get calls from developers that are looking at properties around the Hayden area, and they often ask, what type of housing does your community need? And I provide this information to them and say, this is what our, our community members can afford to pay for a housing unit. Can you make this type of housing work here? Um, because somebody coming in and building a whole bunch of units at a price point that your community can't actually afford to access um, might not be the best maneuver. But if they know that coming through our process and building slightly smaller homes, 
that are at a lower price point might actually get people into those, you know, starter homes or transitional homes. Um, then they kind of understand our market better and know if it's if they're willing to take the first steps in actually developing something here. Next slide, please. So this specifically, this one speaks specifically to for sale product. The next slide is specific to rental product. In addition to having a really constrained for sale product market, our rental market is very tight. Um, we do not have large apartment complexes here. The, generally, any rental is going to be, um, you know, an individually owned rental property, or there's a few very small complexes of like 10 or less units. You can't just Google, you know, rentals in Hayden and have them come up. You have to know where to find them. Um, and because it's so word of mouth, it's really difficult for an employer, for say, to be interested in hiring an out of area applicant to, you know, for workforce here because they can't find a rental. It's really hard to come into this community because it's really difficult to find a rental. Um, it also really limits that, you know, people moving through kind of the housing continuum um, here in this community when we've got, you know, young adults that want to stay in Hayden but don't want to live with their parents anymore, it's difficult to find rentals. Um, so this, again, is an inventory constraint. Next slide, please. So what are our barriers to creating new inventory, capital gap, to be able to build anything? Building houses within those price ranges identified that people can afford here is extremely difficult because land has become incredibly expensive, infrastructure, labor, materials, soft costs to building, all those things are so large that when you do that calculation at the end of the day, it doesn't pencil out to be able to make those units meet a 100% AMI level. Um, so through our process of our housing needs assessment, we also contracted to be able to do a housing action plan because the housing needs assessment was in essence, what is going on, what, what are we missing? And then the action plan is what do we do about it? Um, and the action plan is the tools and approaches and different things as a municipality we can do to close that capital gap. Next slide, please. So one thing we also want to touch on about housing costs here in Hayden specifically that are that are maybe unique to our story or other communities like to us or similar to us um, is that there's this hidden cost of housing when it comes to commuting. Um, commuting is not free. Commuting is really expensive. When we have 70 percent roughly of our community members every day driving to mostly steamboat, sometimes Craig, to go work, that is an expense that oftentimes is really hidden. Our housing needs assessment identified that for somebody to commute into Hayden every day, that's essentially an additional $7,000 cost annually um, associated with the location of your housing. Next slide, please. I'll just keep going. So with our um, housing action plan, one of the conversations that we really had to have here was something that Matthew touched on previously, is what is the role of a municipality when it comes to housing? Um, traditionally in our community, the idea of the local government interfering in the private market is not incredibly popular. So how do we kind of address those pinch points we're not developers. Um, that's a huge role to take on. We certainly can try to help in whatever way is possible. Um, so we really use the housing needs assessment as a communication tool. We are able to communicate with developers what we're lacking, what we need, 
Um, what are priorities within our community when it comes to housing? So they can look at, at that document and communicate with us, look at our master plan and decide whether or not it makes sense to build here for them. Um, the housing needs assessment really steers that conversation about price points. As a municipality, we're very open to creative types of housing um, through a planned unit development process. We want to be flexible um, and be reasonable and realistic. We also want development that is authentic to what makes sense in our community. Um, and that all really um, comes down to having a collaborative relationship with the development community. We do not position ourselves as being adversarial. Um, we try to have clear and consistent communication and we try to be as efficient as possible because at the end of the day, this might help reduce soft costs for development. If we are being clear, consistent, um, and transparent with development or developers coming into our community, then we're more likely that they're gonna, you know, maybe come through our process in actuality, not waste our time because we have a capacity constraint too. Um, I mean, I'm a department of one, so I can only spend so much time working on every single project. Um, and at the end of the day, if it reduces soft costs, it might also reduce the actual cost of those units. Next slide, please. So through that clear, concise communication with developers about what we can and cannot do to help their project, is important. If someone's coming through with a solely market rate development, we might not be able to throw a bunch of resources at them. If somebody's coming through with a dedicated affordable housing development with some sort of community benefit, we could probably do quite a few things. We might be able to advocate on their behalf trying to find funding. Um, we could probably waive fees. We can look into exemptions on property taxes. So depending on what they're able to offer us and bring to the table, we can in turn um, allocate more resources towards it. And having that conversation up front is important because not every development is gonna get the same amount of attention because not every development is contributing the same exact thing to the community. Um, that's just being realistic with folks. Um, additionally, in our action plan, the number one strategy that was recommended was to coalesce around feasible development. So when we're communicating with developers, and this is a, you know, it's a feasible development, it's really going to come through, they're going to provide some great resources to our community. That is where we throw some of that extra effort. Um, that's where we put those resources. And that's where we let them know that this is a good fit for us. because. We want that to actually come to fruition. Um, I talk to a lot of folks that consider developing in Hayden, and some of them I know is going to be one single conversation and they're not going to come back because this is just not exactly what they're looking to do. Um, some of them I have really fruitful conversations with and they quickly realize what it is that our community wants here and what works for our community, what's going to be um, realistic for them to either sell or rent in our community and then they keep coming back for more information and maybe it turns into an actual development application um, but that's an important strategy for us to utilize and it costs us zero dollars to be supportive and communicative it might cost us some time and some money to be able to actually throw real resources into it though next slide please One additional strategy we discussed was um, encouraging workforce housing to be built by employers. Um, this is kind of an interesting topic because in a town like Hayden, where inventory is our main issue, we just do not have new building happening here um, on any sort of significant scale. We want new inventory. So we want these employers to build new inventory of workforce housing for their employees. That's very important. Um, some of these other strategies of housing stipends or rental assistance, 
ultimately compete with the existing extraordinarily constrained market. Um, so it might not actually be helping anything. We want them to build new inventory. So we've communicated that to folks and we actually are seeing this happen on a, on a small scale. And it's not from these large employers listed on here. It's actually been from some smaller employers. And we've seen construction companies or labor type companies um, coming through and wanting to build you know, maybe an industrial shop for themselves and then a, a unit or two of workforce housing um, to be able to house their employees. So it's been kind of interesting that in practice, this is a little different than it, we initially anticipated because it's not one giant employer building a development for their staff, it's these smaller one-offs. Next slide, please. And I'll just also note what it really comes down to our economy and our workforce and housing and strengthening our economy. One conversation that we have a lot, um, it's about people coming here wanting to start businesses in Hayden um, and the benefits and incentives we might be able to offer. A lot of that is tied to whether or not they're gonna pay a living wage to their staff. And that's something that we've clearly communicated because it is vital that the businesses that we're supporting coming here pay a living wage. Um, of course, there are always gonna be employers that don't, and those are just specific types of industries, but the types of industries that are really important for us to attract are living wage industries. So just a couple additional strategies, land banking, that looks a little different than Hayden, in Hayden than some places. Again, this is kind of a controversial topic because are we developers or are we municipal employees? Um, I don't think it would be incredibly popular in our community if we went and just tried to buy land everywhere for development. It's really expensive um, at this moment with our valuations. However, we have identified town owned parcels and considered priorities for those parcels um, and identified which ones might feasibly work for some sort of housing development in the future. Um, so although we're not particularly interested in amassing more land, it made us consider reevaluating the land we already own and potential uses. An additional strategy is accessory dwelling units, which is really appealing to us here in the town because we already allow accessory dwelling units. They're underutilized, um, the implementation of them is. And there's just a lot of really interesting approaches you could take as a municipality um, to encourage or incentivize folks that are building accessory dwelling units to be able to use them for long-term rentals. Um, one really cool approach that I've seen happen elsewhere is municipalities creating a pipeline of accessory dwelling units from specific um, manufacturers. And so members of the public are able to have access to the units that they are guaranteed will meet the development codes and building codes of that area specifically. They understand transparently what the price points of those units are. And there's even some potential for municipalities to manage a program where um, there's a little bit of a reduced rate due to bulk purchasing of those accessory dwelling units um, or reductions on transportation costs because they can put it all together in a package for a bunch of community members at once. Next slide, please. So through our housing action plan, in essence, the consultant came up with a toolkit with all these different things. So some other items in that toolkit besides the ones I've already mentioned. So rehabilitation and weatherization programs. We wanna keep the existing housing stock we have in good working operating order um, because we don't wanna reduce our housing units at all. Annual renew of our short-term rental policy at this moment in Hayden. We don't feel as though short-term rentals are um, endangering our housing stock. And that's because our policy requires that if it's in a residential zone district, it be the person's primary residence that they are renting. Um, so that means nobody can buy as, as an investment property as a rental. Annexation and PUD policies specific to requiring some sort of specific housing or affordable housing, um, that's a relatively easy um, 
regulation change to undertake. And then last, we implemented an inclusionary zoning policy, um, which allows for three options. The first being 10% of new housing developments that exceed four units to have dedicated affordability requirements. And it's on a sliding scale, um, a fee in lieu of compliance with dedicating the units at 10% of the market value. And that money goes to our municipal housing authority for them to be able to use for future projects. Or alternatively, we allow um, an applicant to propose a significant community benefit. And that might be, who knows what, we have a list of things that are kind of priorities for our community. Um, but some properties are positioned in a way that they can maybe provide something else that's not housing, but alternatively kind of makes our livability index higher here in Hayden. Um, for example, child care space. So we, it was our council's desire to have a very flexible um, policy when it came to housing. And this is our approach at that flexibility. Next slide, please. Um, <clears throat> just before we move on to just a comment to mention about inclusionary zoning from a policy perspective. Um, I know this is probably, this could be a controversial topic, um, but the question that our community asked itself through this entire process, which is what led to this housing policy, was what kind of a community do we wanna be? And do we wanna be a community supporting our teachers, police department, fire department, um, but we also had the desire for them to move up in housing. Hayden has a housing ownership rate of around like 70%. And we wanted to like maintain that, it was really important. So it was, how do we strike a balance on inclusionary zoning where we know we want a diversity of people, ideas, perspectives, and affordability. So how do we do that? But how do we do that in a way that we still encourage development and we don't scare that off? And I'll just tell you that um, right now, within the last four months of adopting this policy, actually within the last three, we have over almost 300 new units in our planning process. So it didn't scare them off. And they're working with us right now um because we made it flexible enough like tegan said so thanks to you yeah and then kind of the last um strategy in our housing action plan that was recommended was to grow capacity in local housing organizations so the town of hayden actually formally um established a municipal housing authority in order to pursue this and municipal housing authorities can do things that maybe our town council or town couldn't otherwise do and can better incentivize um, certain types of housing through um, you know property tax waivers use tax waivers through small fractional ownerships of those projects so this is a great tool for us to use we have because they're so new um, getting them kind of up and running and going is you know an ongoing process but because we have the perspective of some really great housing developments coming through it's fabulous that we have that established um, and it's just another communication tool with developers that we're being honest about wanting a certain type of housing next slide please And ultimately our entire housing action plan, which is kind of our toolkit of how we are gonna address housing. It's so specific to what we do here in Hayden, but I think a lot of those are gonna be strategies that people can replicate in other similar communities. Um, but it's nice to have it tailored really to what, what makes sense here, because there are definitely some strategies out there that are great that work in other communities that would not work here. Um, so to wrap this up, I think with the conclusion in our path forward, you know, we have a supply and demand problem and that I keep honing in on that. Um, but at the same time, I think it's important to just understand what's driving the problem so that you can address the problem um, and how, 
you know, Hayden had a housing problem since 2010, even though you didn't think that. When I went to buy a home, when I first moved here, bought one in 2017, you know, I, had, I, I looked at like three homes and I chose one. And that might not be a bad thing, but when you only have three to four homes on the market at any given time, and now we might have like one, um, that makes it very difficult. You know, po the positive is home values here are higher than they have ever been. You go to sell your home today, you're gonna, you're gonna do okay. As long as you bought that home two years ago. The negative, the AMI values now, if you're two teachers at $80,000 total or $90,000 total, you can't afford to buy a home. That's not good. And that's why we adopted our housing policy with the inclusionary zoning. And then on, a, on our current path, remember, we're a coal transition community. The power plant that's I'm pointing to the east is, um, if, if that is not, if that current plan that's at the ERP doesn't get approved, you know, we're looking at 55% property tax loss for our school district, library district, school, cemetery district, fire district. It's actually 65% for our fire district. So, you know, we've got to solve this housing problem so that our economic plans of attracting business as well as helping our local businesses thrive, they've got to have places for their people to live. We formed a housing authority in 2021 to help with this. Remember those tools in the tool belt? And then, you know, we know we need the private sector to succeed. Those uh, housing um, units that I'm talking about that I just mentioned previously, you know, those are, both of those are public-private partnerships between the town and the private sector. We can't do this on our own. And, you know, maybe we shouldn't. Uh, some people are addressing it. And if that's your path, that's great. If that's what your council um, is approving. But here, we saw the benefit of a public-private partnership where everybody is winning. Um, you know, Hayden prides itself on a community and a small town feel, and we can't lose that. So that goes back to that housing policy, but also just keeping your planning and your master plan in front of you, because that's what should be driving this. So, and with that, I think that was the last slide. Yes, it was. Okay, wonderful. I'll actually stop sharing the screen. Um, so that we can move on to the um, Q&A portion. First of all, I can tell you guys are local government professionals because you handled <laughs> that very well and just kept presenting even with the frustrations of the lag, so thank you. But, so let's go straight to some of the questions. The first one, the creation of the housing action plan, was that part of the same process as developing your housing needs assessment or was it separate? It was all within the same scope of work that our um, consultants attacked for, you know, our housing needs assessment and action plan. It was all kind of one scope of work package. However, it was a separate process that we went through. So we created the housing needs assessment and, you know, got to almost a finalized point with that and then worked on the housing action plan. But it was all built within that same funding mechanism. Okay. And an important point with that, just to add to that quickly, is that um, I, I'm the type of manager, I guess, that um, I, I never like to look at plans without actions to implement them. So the action plan was actually probably the, the more important step that we took because now we, now every time we're looking at how we address housing, we're just pulling from that and we're just working on it. And every time somebody says, well, you know, how, do you, how are you going to address housing? We can go to the Department of Local Affairs and be like, right here, see this action step? This is the one we're taking. And they're like, okay, great. Thanks. So. Perfect. Um, it looks like this next question came in, um, but then you ended up addressing it later. So um, what about short-term rentals? Um, does Hayden have short-term rentals? And if so, do you regulate them? So I know you said you didn't think it was much of a problem, but if you have any other thoughts. Just yeah, we do, but we do regulate them. And we did address it because our plan was we have a we have a few we have i think we have like seven or eight or something like that right now we have a few but we also have seen the issues that other communities are dealing with so we did adopt a formal policy tegan uh mentioned that in our um in our presentation and it specifically i think the keys are if uh you're in a commercial district 
you can have a short-term rental. Like we just treat it as lodging. We're like, great, it's a commercial only thing, no big deal. Pay your lodging tax, thanks, have a nice day. Um, but if you are in a residential zone, essentially we do not allow short-term rentals. Um, but there's a caveat because if it's your primary residence, then we do allow, you know, but Tegan used the example, you know, if you're a snowbird, we have some of those here because um, we got a lot of snow here. And so they leave to Arizona, but it's like four months. So they can rent out their house for four months. They can come back, make it their primary residence, and that's okay. okay. Alternatively, somebody can use their accessory dwelling unit on their primary residence property as a short-term rental. So that's where that like ADU toolkit action plan item is kind of cool if we incentivize ADU specifically to be used for long-term rentals because alternatively somebody could use it as an income property for short-term rentals. Um, how is the community reacting to the town taking the stance of wanting more inventory? Um, well, we had a pretty engaging process with our community. These, uh, the affordable housing project that we are partnering with Gorman and company on, uh, which is a 180 unit multi-dimensional multi-housing project, some for sale product. Um, they've been pretty receptive, but I think they identified that they needed housing. <laughs> uh, one of our planning commission members said, um, you know, my grandkids moved back and uh, we can't find them a place to live. So they're living with their parents, but they don't need that. They have a job. They just can't find them anything and then they can't afford anything. So as much as he probably did not, uh, wouldn't have been in favor, you know, of a housing policy, he now is because he sees, you know, the alternative. Um, and so I think generally they're reacting well. The key, I think, is to like do that within your master plan, you know, like, we and those vision and mission statements um, stick within those. Um, and, you know, there's always a little bit of pushback with a little bit of change. Um, and at the same time, you know, just being humble and listening to people, I think is uh, really beneficial. So Tegan, anything to add? Um, I mean, there is always going to be a certain degree of people recoiling at things changing in their landscape, especially in a community where nothing significantly has changed in a very long time. However, we do, we, during our master plan process, it was quite clear people want, um, you know, infill, they want, they want amenities here. People want restaurants and retail, and they don't want to have to drive into Steve or Craig to do it. They want to be able to work here if, they want to be able to live and work here and not use it as a bedroom community. And in order to do that, there has to be a certain degree of growth. I mean, you can't have all those restaurants and retail and things if there's not enough population to support it. Um, so we hear, I mean, there's there's always going to be a degree of, you know, a certain percentage of the population just not agreeing with growth, period. Um, but overwhelmingly, the voice the voices of the community are in the opposite camp. They want to see Hayden succeed and grow in a way that makes sense here. Perfect, thank you. Next question. Does Hayden have any water constraints moving forward, water restraints moving forward with development in Buena Vista that drives our development at this time? So um, Hayden's water portfolio is actually quite robust. Um, and at the same time, the Yampa River uh, was designated as over-appropriated, I think, two years ago, maybe. Maybe it was a year ago. I can't remember. Um, but nonetheless, um, we have a couple things. So one, um, if any housing development that, e e whether you're in the town or not, if they have associated water rights with that piece of land, we automatically require those rights to be dedicated to the town for service. It's a no questions asked type of thing. Second, yeah, especially with annexation. But second, um, the town, <laughs> the the people previously with the town of Hayden long time ago uh, were able to build a pretty robust water portfolio. Um, and as Buena Vista looks at things as well, our master plan was really built around knowing how much water supply we could effectively deliver even if nobody dedicated a single water right. 
So we have enough capacity within that master plan. 15 years from now, when that master plan is, if it's, if you assume it's built out, it'll have to be a different conversation. Yeah, we will not consider annexation without water rights associated with those properties that can sustain the potential development of whatever that property would be zoned. Yeah. And, and uh, the key is that um, we won't look at it on paper. We literally look at them and say, um, we have to see your water flow, like deliverable, like we have to touch it. Because if we can't touch it, and you can't prove that you can get it from point A to point B to us, um, then that's not good enough. Perfect. Um, does Hayden own any land that they can donate to developers who promise to provide affordable housing units? We have very small pieces of land. So it wouldn't typically be something that would be appealing to a developer because it's not a big enough site, but we have these small pieces of land that potentially the town of Hayden the Municipal Housing Authority at some point could pursue um, their own project for like a small multifamily housing unit site. Um, but we don't have big enough pieces that would appeal to a developer. Okay. Let's see, this looks like um, there might be, it's a long question. Many of the action steps would require the town to either contribute money or give up on revenue. With contributing money, how much money do you have and how will you prioritize the limited funds available as projects come? So in terms of budget, since I'm the one who has to manage it, is uh, we at Hayden are very, very efficient with taking a little bit of money and going to other entities and maximizing. When I talked about that five-year window, um, that five-year window is looking at all of the federal funding and everything else that is flowing into the state right now. And we have been applying. And then that goes back also to that public-private partnership where you are able to use your private developers' contributions as match moving forward for a lot of these grants. But that money flows into the town. Um, and then I would ask another question because, you know, it says, you know, are, are you giving up on revenue? um maybe but if you don't have people housing for people to have jobs that will actually contribute into your community if you do the math you're probably uh that little bit of revenue you might have got that year you're going to lose anyway so it's important to think long term and if i'm waving now we have some lines in the sand we typically we've never waived a tap fee We've never waived, um, you know, those kind of essential services. We've never done that, um, but we've done other things like, you know, building costs and things like that. So I think it's about looking, thinking long term, and looking at, yes, maybe you're losing the revenue today, but three years from now you're going to lose even more. So it's a matter of uh, looking long term. Perfect. And looking for alternative funding sources. Yes, we do that very, very well. <laughs> um, and a lot of times. Because yeah. our budget's as tight as anybody's. Yeah. Um, and so we have to take whatever we have and then we build on that, then we take that and then we make it bigger, we make it bigger, and then we make it bigger. And until we meet the demand of what we're trying to do. All right, I think we have time for one more question. And it's, how do you define significant community benefit? Do you provide examples or guidelines for developers to submit their own ideas? So we have in our housing policy, um, it's defined as being of approximate equivalent value, um, fiscal value to the fee and lieu. Um, they have to present it to our town council. We can require whatever studies um, are necessary. So if it's some sort of economic benefit analysis, um, and then they have to come up with that package to go to town council and town council has to approve it. We had our town council come up with an example list of things that they would like to see as significant community benefits. Um, so somebody doesn't come in and say like some off the wall random thing that we just really don't need. Um, 
but like childcare space, for example, like we, along with housing, we also have a childcare shortage. And that is huge for us to be able to potentially get more childcare space. Um, so that was like the top of the list of our town council. And the first development that came through after that policy was adopted. They are trying to go for that. And it's because they are in a location positioned directly next to an existing nonprofit childcare facility. So it makes an expansion actually possible, whereas a different lot might not work. It feels like you guys willed that into existence, right? That it worked out that <laughs> so well. Do it. <laughs> so, yeah. okay, well, wonderful. Um, so that wraps up our time and our questions. So that worked out perfectly, but I do want to give you guys a chance to offer any closing thoughts if you might have any, or if you said everything that you need to say. Tegan, do you have anything? Um, I guess you just have to really look at your own community and think about the specific things in your own community that make sense because it's so unique and particular to what your community wants. Um, I would say let your vision, mission drive your policies and I think you'll be fine. Perfect. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Matthew. Thank you so much, Tegan. To all of our attendees, thank you for um, attending. And I will send out an email tomorrow, um, including today's slides. They'll also be posted on our website. Um, we're getting some thank yous in coming through the Q&A. So just wanted to pass that along to Matthew and Tegan. And with that, this concludes the webinar. Have a good afternoon, everyone. Thank you.